So today we are nope. here to talk about Empire of the Summer Moon. Empire of the Summer Moon, um, which is a book by an author, a Texas author named S.C. Gwynn. And I read this book about seven or eight years ago, long before I moved to Texas. And uh, I just found it fascinating. And so we were looking for a Texas book to put on the reading discussion group list this year. I thought this would be a good one, and I'm happy to do the presentation. Um, after reading Empire of the Summer Moon, I was fascinated about the Comanche, and I wanted to learn more about how they got to be what they became. And so S.C. Gwynn sort of picks up with them maybe in the 1700s, late 1700s, but I really like ancient history and I wanted more. So, I read another book. This one, Comanche Empire. It's by an author whose name is Pekka Hamelainen, and that is a Finnish name, and he is a Finn. And why he cares about American Plains Indians, I don't know, but he's a recognized expert on the Comanche and the Lakota. He's also written a book about the Lakota. Anyway, his book goes back, way back, into the 1100s, uh, before the first white men made it to the USA. And um, so what we're talking about with this group of Native Americans is different from most Native American history that at least I was familiar with. Now some of you may have known all about this. I did not. Now this is interesting because I went to school uh, in Oklahoma where we had six months of required Oklahoma State history and a lot of it was about Indians. Yeah. They didn't teach me this stuff. So, anyway. They also didn't teach us about the Greenwood Massacre, which had happened only 60 miles away, and there were still people alive that went through it. So, that maybe says more about the education system than anything else. Um, anyway, this is a story in which the Indians uh, expand, dictate, and prosper, and the European colonists... Oh my God, this is great. The European colonists resist, retreat, and struggle to survive for hundreds of years until it all changed. So in some ways, the Comanche story is a typically American immigrant success story. And when we get to that part of the story, I'll explain why. Now, by the way, many of the pictures of Native American life that I'm going to show you today in this little slide presentation come from the collection of the Eamon Carter Museum in Fort Worth, where I happen to be a docent, so anyway. It's a nice museum. If you haven't been there, you ought to go. Uh, the Comanche are from the same language and ethnic roots as the Aztecs. I did not know that. Uh, part of a group called the Uto Aztecans that starting in the 1100s built a flourishing culture in what is now Nevada, western Utah, and southwestern Oregon. That's also, that area is also called the Great Basin. Okay. The people who became the Aztecs were the first to leave, and they moved south to what is now Mexico. You can kind of see this here, um, in the 1400s. So it took them a long time to get there, and if you ever go to Mexico City and go to any of the museums there, uh, you will find that, that they talk about a place called Aztlan, A-Z-T-L-A-N, as the ancestral home of the Aztecs, and there were high mountains there. So these are sort of like uh, racial memories of that place where they came from. Anyway, um, in the meantime, the other members of the group, the Shoshone, the ones that didn't go to Mexico, move east to the Great Plains, apparently triggered by climate change. Beginning in the Little Ice Age, which brought colder temperatures and higher rainfall. And what that meant, and this is a really important part of the story, as the steady rains nourished the grassland, bison herds began to increase. So bison, more Indians. More bison, more Indians. And that goes on for hundreds of years. People flowed from the Rocky Mountains, from the northern woodlands, and from the Mississippi onto the Great Plains. This was the, in, ter in terms of numbers, 
one of the largest internal migrations in the history of North America. And of course, none of these people had written languages. So we don't know much about it. And the way they can surmise that this happened is by patterns of languages and comparing languages that exist today and then using uh, the folk tales of these people. So a distinct branch of Plain Shoshones emerged in this time. They occupied the northwestern plains between the South Platte and the Upper Yellowstone River. The eastern Shoshones became typical plains hunters who shaped their diet, economy, and culture around the habits of the buffalo. And that would not change for hundreds of years. And it was a great strength, but in the end, it was a great weakness. They lived as nomads, following their migrant prey on foot, moving their belongings on small dog travelway, and sheltering themselves with light, easily transportable tents called teepees. Now, they hunted bison on foot at this time, because they didn't have horses. They surrounded the animals, ran them into soft ice or deep snow, or drove them off steep cliffs. These communal hunts absorbed a lot of time and energy and required careful planning, but a single successful hunt could feed and shelter a group for a season. And this slide just sort of shows you all the things, and it's only some of the things that Native Americans could get from a buffalo. Everything but the squeal. <laughs> Sometime in the late 1600s, the Shoshone split, and they left the Central Plains. Most of them went north of Yellowstone, but a smaller faction headed south, and they show up in the early 1700s in the Spanish records in New Mexico, what is now New Mexico, as Comanches. They may have been driven by disease. European diseases like smallpox or measles could have been spread to them through eastern tribes, or, they may, or it may have been to gain better access to the Spanish horses that had just begun to spread north in large numbers. So, in 1680, the Pueblo in New Mexico, centered on Santa Fe, revolted against the Spanish. And they drove the Spanish out of New Mexico for several decades, okay? And when that happened, the Indians got all the horses. And so the Pueblo had more horses than they could use, so they started bartering with other tribes. And eventually, those horses reached a little farther north, and the Comanche came across them and they said, wow, this is a great thing. <laughs> so the Comanche followed the horse flow back to its source in New Mexico. In the north, tales that the Shoshone tribe, the people that went to uh, Yellowstone, still tell, remember the Comanche as the people who went south to follow the ponies. When they got there, they allied with the Utes. This is another tribe it's from the same language group. They were already there. So now we're talking about sort of northern New Mexico. That's kind of the area. And they entered, the Comanche then entered a period of spectacular change, reinventing themselves within a few years, technologically, economically, militarily, and socially. They adjusted to their new homeland, um, and an ecological patchwork that extended east from the Great Plains to the Rocky Mountain foothills. And they lived um, in uh, large mobile teepee villages called rancherias. And this is what a rancheria looks like. And that's a word they probably stole from the Spanish. Um, from the Utes, they got two things. One, horses and the knowledge of how to use them for transportation, for hunting, and for warfare. And number two, access to European markets, mostly in New Mexico, and European industrial goods, okay? So this is a big change. Um, these uh, teepee rancherias could have as many as 250 uh, individuals living in each one of them. And a typical Comanche uh, clan would have as many as a thousand horses. So they would plant their teepees in one place, the horses graze, once the horses have eaten up all the grass, they move. So 
they're only in one place for maybe a week or two weeks, but they're moving constantly um, during the summer months or during the warm months. The Comanche also, the Ute also introduced the Comanche to Spanish markets in New Mexico, and the Comanche were soon regular visitors to Taos, where they bartered robes, meat, and Navajo slaves for maize, horses, pottery, and cotton blankets. And um, one thing that I was kind of surprised to find out from the second book was how important slaves were to the Comanche economy. They were really the key um, for a lot of different reasons. First of all, because of their lifestyle, um, they never had huge population growth, and so some of it was just to s sustain their numbers, they needed outsiders coming in. But it's also possible that they may have, just through the process of observation, recognized that people who had European ancestry had a better chance of surviving things like smallpox and measles and stuff like this, which were deadly to Native Americans who, who had no European ancestry. At any rate, uh, by the 1710s, so they first got started to get guns in 1680, so this is really important. They've got the horses a little bit before that, and then they start getting their guns. Uh, but the raids, so then they start raiding Spanish settlements, mestizo settlements in New Mexico, but that was just the beginning. Because the other thing that the horse brought them was it made them so much more mobile in so many ways. A horse could carry 200 pounds on its back and drag up to 300 pounds on a travoy, four times as much as a dog, and could cover at least twice the distance in a day that a dog could travel. So, Okay, there they are. Uh, with the rise of equestrianism, Comanches could transport more hides, meat, and household utensils, and they could search for prey over a wider range and kill animals more effectively. Their reach of trade was multiplied, as was their ability to wage war, plunder, and defend themselves. Their world became smaller, and the resources became more available to them. Now, this is quite a different story from what is going on. Remember, we're now in the early 1700s, and so think about what's happening on the east coast of the United States in terms of Native Americans. This is a very different story. Think about what happened in Mexico to Native Americans. <coughs> they were enslaved starting in the 1500s by the Spanish. So these, these people, this is quite different, okay? Not only were the Comanche one of the first tribes to acquire horses and one of the few to purposefully breed them, they also fought on horseback, a skill unknown among most other Indian peoples. And the European militaries, who rode their horses into battle, then got off and then fought. Um, and it took many decades for the Europeans to learn the skill. You'd think they would have figured it out, but it took a while. <laughs> So the sudden availability of European goods had a, had a momentous impact. It moved the Comanche overnight from the Stone Age through the Iron Age and into the Gunpowder Age, like that. Um, now, Spanish law prohibited the sale of firearms to Indians, but we all know what people in the Southwest United States think of gun laws, and they were not well enforced. Uh, long time problem. The available weapons were cumbersome and fragile flintlocks, but they still profoundly changed the nature of intertribal warfare. Comanches could now kill, maim, and shock from the safety of uh, distance and inflict wounds that the tr traditional healing arts of their enemies could not heal. So it really gave them a military advantage over other Indians and it also gave them a military advantage over the Europeans, who didn't know the terrain and, you know, always had to get off their horses before they could shoot at the Indians, who were long gone by that time. So at the dawn of the 1700s, the Comanche were set up to force their way onto the southern plains, shove aside the Apache and other resident Indians, and over three generations, carve out a vast territory that was larger than the entire European-controlled area north of the Rio Grande. 
And so this map, kind of a vintage map, this shows you the territory that the Comanche control. And at the height of their uh, population, they probably had, there were probably 40,000 people living in their villages. This is a huge area. These people were very thinly spread out, but they were highly mobile, okay? And they had a lot of interconnections among the groups. They were about to do something that generations of American immigrants have been doing ever since. Move to regions experiencing strong economic gro growth. This is a difficult process. You've got to leave behind your relatives, your friends, and the familiarity of home in search of prosperity. But that is exactly what the Comanche did in the 1700s. So they became the lords of the southern plains, ferocious horse riding warriors who forestalled European intrusions into the American Southwest until well into the late 19th century. In the mid-1700s, they reinvented themselves once more, this time as a hegemonic people who grew increasingly powerful and prosperous at the expense of the surrounding societies, Indian and European alike. Now this map, I would call this a white man's map, white man's map of North America in, let's say, the late 17, early 1800s. And so the green um, is the French, the blue is the English, the brown is the Spanish. And you know, there's this little piece over here, and it looks like, well, they ain't no way there. Well, that is wrong. And this is some, kind of the map that we looked at in school, because there are people there. And they are the Comanche and their allies. So they extracted resources, horses, mules, European manufactured goods, and labor from their Euro-American and Indian neighbors through thievery and through tribute, and incorporated foreigners into their villages as adopted kinspeople or slaves. The Comanche Empire was powered by violence, but like most viable empires, it was first and foremost an economic destruction. At its core was an extensive commercial network that allowed Comanches to control nearby border, border markets and long distance trade, swing surrounding groups into their political orbit, and spread their language and culture across the mid continent. Now, this might this might sound a little bit familiar to you as you think of the histories that you have read of the United States. Just think about that for a while. To cope with the opportunities and changes of their rapid expansion, the Comanche created a centralized, multi-level political system, a flourishing market economy, and a graded social organization that was flexible enough to sustain and survive the burdens of their external ambitions, which meant that Wealth didn't pass down the line necessarily generation to generation. The most skilled, the most um, talented, the best warriors, the best horse breeders tended to rise to the top in every generation. Uh, while Comanches reached unparalleled heights of political and economic influence, material wealth, and internal stability, the Spanish colonies the subsequent Mexican provinces, and the Texas settlements, along with many neighboring indigenous and industrial society, uh, agricultural societies, suffered from a number of disruptions that the Comanche initiated. And that's why this map looks the way. So the Comanche achieved something quite exceptional. They built an imperial organization that subdued exploited, marginalized, co-opted, and profoundly transformed colonial output, per outposts, reversing the conventional European imperial trajectory that was going on all over the world at this time. I mean, remember, the French, the English, even the Germans, uh, Scandinavians, they were all establishing colonies all over the world, and these people brought them sort of to a halt in this part. And um, a long-standing notion is that the course of early American history was determined by people in Madrid, London, Versailles, 
Mexico City and Washington, and that's true to some extent. But what these people did had a huge impact on what this map looks like. For one thing, if the Comanche had not been there, we would probably all be speaking Spanish today. Now, the way things are going, we may all be speaking Spanish anyway. <laughs> in a few years. But it would have happened a lot sooner. Uh, at the same time, as New Spain was trying to move north from central Mexico, Uh, and New France was trying to absorb that green area and move a little to the west. Uh, and the U.S., the newly formed U.S., was becoming a, or thinking about becoming a transcontinental power. The, Com the Comanche already had an aggressive power policy in the center. Now, the fact that Comancheria was encircled throughout its existence by European-American settler colonies makes the Comanches an unlikely candidate for regional supremacy. When you think about the fact these people had no written language, um, they had some European tools and implements, but not the latest thing. Um, uh, of course, their supply lines were all internal, but they didn't have you know, the benefit of getting goods directly from industrial parts of the world. But their overwhelming, mil and their o nonetheless, their overwhelming military force would have allowed them to destroy many New Mexico and Texas settlements and drive most of the colonists out of their borders. But they did not do that. Okay? Now this map shows you Comancheria, which I've talked about before, and then that area to the south down into Mexico, um, and it actually should kind of go up a little more to the west there, that was their raiding zone. So that's where they went every year and basically stole horses and mules, okay? And they killed a lot of people. But they didn't want to kill everybody, and they didn't want to take all the horses and mules because they wanted these people to stay there and keep growing horses and mules so they could come back next year. Okay? And then what they did was they made deals. Okay? And sometimes they made deals with the Spanish in New Mexico, and sometimes they made deals with the French, or later the Americans, over here on the eastern side to sell them those mules and horses. And the U.S. Army bought a lot of mules and horses that came through this pipeline, just as well. So they were an imperial power with a difference. Their aim was not to conquer and colonize, but to coexist, to control, and to exploit. And you, if you stop to think about the way the United States of America today, and for a long time in the past, has conducted its foreign policy, in many respects, it is very similar, it seems to me. Others of you may think differently, and you will get your chance. Uh, now, <clears throat> the other thing that the Comanche did was weaken the governments whom they faced, particularly the Spanish. Um, in the 1700s and early 1800s, Texas uh, was a money pit consuming the res resources of the Spanish Empire in the New World. They spent a lot of money, they lost a lot of men here uh, trying to settle Texas or pacify the Comanche, and they were never able to do it. And this went on for over a hundred years. And they tried this, and they tried that, and they tried bribery, and they tried warfare, and more bribery. Nothing worked. And, and by the way, the Comanche were always here. Um, now, the Achilles heel of the Comanche, of course, were the buffalo. Once a seemingly inexhaustible resource. And but what happened in the early 1830s was there was an extended drought on the Great Plains that extended into the 1840s, and the buffalo herds were weakened and started to climb. At the same time, the Comanche and their allied Native American tribes were overhunting uh, because they needed the buffalo not just to support themselves, but they needed to sell the robes and the leather and the other things that came from the buffalo. So they overhunted 
and then the drought came, and then after the Civil War, of course, it all got a lot worse. But around about the same time, another thing happened to the Comanche. Disease on a massive scale. So this map shows you the spread of the smallpox epidemic of 1836 to 1840. Now there had been smaller epidemics in the early 1800s, and then again in 1848 and 1851. But this killed hundreds of thousands of Native Americans. It's estimated that the Comanche population, which had been around 40,000 at the end of the 1700s, had dropped to about 25,000 by the 1820s, or early 1830s. At the same time, the European settlements around them were increasing in population. And in Texas in particular, starting in, let's say, the 1830s, there was a big influx of white Americans and their slaves that took the population of Texas. Uh, it just grew, the white population of Texas just grew dramatically. So things are starting to look not so good. And then along come the railroads. And there were a lot of impacts on Native Americans from the railroads, but one of them was the buffalo. Because the railroads didn't want the buffalo out there crapping up the railroad tracks and running into their trains. So they hired hunters to come out, and that was disastrous enough. And then in 1870, some ingenious tanners in Philadelphia figured how to take buffalo hides and turn them into um, industrial leather for machine belts. So now there was even more of an economic incentive to kill the buffalo and take their hides. So the slaughter moved into high gear and the Comanche found their hunting grounds empty. Then finally, after the Civil War, the U.S. Cavalry arrived. Now during the Civil War, they had uh, been schooled in how to wage total war against rebellious populations. So these three fellas, uh, U.S. Grant, William Tecumseh Sherman, and Bill Sheridan, turned the success of the March to the Sea uh, on the Comanche. Uh, and there were a number of leaders who did it, but the one to read the most about the book is Ranald McKenzie, Brigadier General Ranald McKenzie. And as you know, he brought the last great Comanche war chief, Juana, into the reservation in 1874. Now, I'm going to pause here just to point out one thing about the history of the Comanche that I've told you. And sometimes, and when I first read this book, Juana's resistance at the point where his numbers are so small, we're talking about a few hundred warriors, and everybody else is either killed on the reservation. Why? Why would you continue to fight? But if your people had a history of really being the top dog for hundreds of years, what would be your expectation? And think about that as an American citizen, if what was left of the United States was in that situation. So I think it puts a different perspective on sort of the last gasp of Comanche resistance. Anyway, want a story. Why is Kwana a big surprise to so many people when they're doing this? I mean, you would think he would be a great Native American hero, and people, some people know who he is, and probably in Texas, maybe more people know than other places. Uh, we had a um, iced tea glass that had Kwana's picture on it when I lived in Oklahoma, so I knew he was somebody special, but I didn't know. <laughs> but why wasn't their history taught? Well, you know, you can kind of blame these guys. Because two years after Qantas surrender, in 1876, Sitting Bull and Custer's 7th Pet Cavalry met at the Little Bighorn, and that disaster captured America's uh, interest and imagination then and has held on to it ever since. So if you go on the internet movie database and you look for movies about Custer, you will see there are 18 movies about Custer. You will see there is one TV show episode and a couple of podcasts about Quanta Park. And the great white hero out of all of this, Ronald McKenzie, nothing. He got nothing. 
okay? But this guy, you know, who really screwed up, he's the one we all know. So, I don't know. The winners don't necessarily get to write the history. First, it probably doesn't help that Randall McKenzie, you know, died with not all of his mental faculties with him, but anyway. So, we owe S.C. Gwynn, I think, a thanks for bringing these people and their history back to popular attention. So I say, let's give Quana the last word and a round of applause. All right. So with that, I'm going to dispense with the microphone. I think you can all hear me. Um, and uh, so we'll go to the discussion questions. Unless somebody has something they want to say first. Anybody's just sitting there dying to make an observation. Well, okay. Well, I am. <laughs> okay. So a couple of years ago, I read this book, and um, my name is Jan. And a couple of years ago, I read this book and was just so fascinated by it. I drove my husband out to West Texas, and we tried to follow along some of the Lano Estacado area, and uh, we've been to Adobe Walls. Um, just places like that, but I have to tell you, it, it's talking about the way history is, it was very difficult, and I, it really touched a little piece of this, very difficult to find these places. I, you know, and I'm not a great researcher either, maybe someone would be able to find maps and things, a little tour you can follow on your self-guided tour, for example, that's what we tried to do. But it was very interesting, you know, had the book out, and we're just going along, and, and trying to envision some of these battles, where the Comanche hid in these areas. So it was pretty fascinating. So I just open up to you, if anybody ever finds any more information about some kind of a tour to go in these areas, because it's not that far from here, right. a lot of it, uh, please let me know, because I would love to go back <laughs> and look at it again. Uh, she went to tour guide. Yes. <laughs> well, you know, to uh, the canyon, what is it? Paladur. 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 Yeah. Paladur. And, and there was a tour there, and I thought just on the canyon, and it's kind of built that you can see where Juana made his last stand. But it was really, I mean, it was an interesting tour in a lot of ways, but it really right. didn't do that. I'm, so even, yeah. you know. It's just a small area. We're talking about a huge yeah. place, yeah. but just Whereas, so fast, I will I will tell you, I've been to the Little Bighorn Bill, mm -hmm. and there are guides out the wazoo, okay, <laughs> that you can get. Yeah. Um, and we got a, a guide who was highly knowledgeable about it, who walked us through the battlefield, you know, in, uh, in the order in which the events happen, you know, and all that. But not for this. Well, isn't, it, isn't one of the reasons for that, though, is that, is that Comanches were very mobile, just as you mentioned. And they didn't fight in one spot. They fought everywhere. And, and they didn't fight pitch battles. Yes, they yeah, just was, went in. Was shoot and run. run. Yeah, they stole what they needed and, and, and they moved on. And they kept moving. So there's not not like a place, that, what you're saying, where there was a major battle in one spot. And I think that's one of the reasons why they had not necessarily seen the kind of interest you might see elsewhere. Okay, go ahead. Um, uh, my name is Lisa Ryder. Um, over the, I've lived in Texas now for 40 years, and over that period of time, I've spent a lot more time in the hill country and then down in the Big Bend area because we chose competition chili cooking as our recreation. <laughs> <laughs> but that's actually what a lot of people who want to go out and spend time in state parks do. Um, and subtly, more subtly, the um, existence and the influence of the Comanches is much more visible starting in the area around the LBJ Ranch and then in the direction towards Big Bend because forts were built that didn't last very long. And finally, the spiritual home of Competition Chile is Terlingua, Texas, and that's about 15 miles north of the border uh, with Mexico. And that's exactly where so the Comanches didn't limit themselves. There were no borders per se, but Mexico was as good a place to go raid as anywhere else. So there's a large swath of area that was known to be where the Comanches went from the hill country we think of in the, you know, west of Austin, off in that direction, and they did that every year. Um, they would go down to Mexico yeah, in the winter time, 
And, uh, yeah. Right. So it's visible in the parts of Texas the Texans don't particularly want to live in right now. Ah. And the I don't know, West Dakota is just a big empty yeah. place. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, you put a sign out there, and 50 years later, it's blown away, and nobody <laughs> noticed it. You know, 10 people noticed it. So. At any rate, I'm just passing that on to keep your eyes open as you tour the rest of the state of Texas. Oh, she's cute. Oh, thank you. Okay, anybody else? Observations. Okay, with that, I'm going to start with the discussion questions, and um, hopefully some of you had a chance to look at these because I sent them out back. So given the conflicting cultures of the Plains Indians and the white settlers, do you think it would have been possible to settle Ameri the American West peacefully? If so, what changes would each culture have, have had to make to bring this about? If not, why not? Anybody, any thoughts? People are shaking their heads. Oh, not likely. Not likely. Uh, the, uh, can you speak up or maybe stand up? Not like. <laughs> <laughs> two sides, if you will, if you want to simplify to the conflict, were too intent on doing what they 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 felt destined to do, and uh, they would have had to change course uh, markedly to to live together in peace in that part of the country. Uh, the Europeans, uh, or at least the American Europeans, would have had to give up on, on uh, the Sea to Shining Sea uh, effort to expand the United States. Uh, I'm not sure how the Comanches would uh, decide that they were happy with not killing everybody or stealing from everybody. Well, they didn't want to kill everybody. Well, uh, enough people to, to keep the war going on. Anyway, they have to change too much both sides. I don't think it could, it, it could have ever happened. Uh, Elaine? Well, there was some comment, I think, in this book about some, some of the Indian tribes still in the East who had tried to blend in, who had even started farming, who had started wearing uh, European clothing, and they still, you know, these treaties that got made were broken on the side of the white settlers. Mm -hmm. And they still got pushed west to, Oklahoma. to sort of useless land. Um, maybe it's useless. Until they found the, until they found the oil. The oil there. Yeah, right. um, so I don't think, I don't think, um, Given, and, and that's because that book is called uh, Pillars of the Ocean. Both, yeah. both, both sides' destinies were just. <coughs> but even if this one had bent, I don't. I think they still have gotten run over. Yeah. Small. Yes. Well, I think part of the, part of the issue is that they have different value systems and different goals. The Europeans that came into Texas and came into Oklahoma, they were looking to farm and to ranch and to to control the land that way. And the Indians were not looking for that. They were looking for the village to come in and feed themselves and move on. So they have a nomadic group and a settled group, and it's pretty hard for those two people to live in harmony because nomadic people don't like those people who are, who are breaking out the land. And it's just this, in the reverse, the other people don't want the nomads to come in and, and mess up their, their play plans. And so I think it would be very difficult unless the whole notion about what was valuable in life were to change, and that's pretty hard to do. Barbed wire fences. Barbed wire fences, yes, exactly. Yeah, part of the problem is not just dealing with two governments or two groups of people. Right. You're dealing literally with 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 a whole, whole variety of people right. who are often in warfare with themselves. So mm -hmm. you know, even if you you know, if we had, had made an arrangement with Comanche, well, you know, there were still hundreds of other people out there. So the next question is, how do you think the United States would have developed into the 20th century if white settlements had stopped at the 98th meridian? And by the way, we live very close to the 98th meridian. So I mean, it, what, what this question is, if there were no white people west of us um, until you got to California, um, what would have happened to the United States? Who would have won the Civil War? What would have happened? <laughs> What do you 
How would how would history have been different? Well, one thing I think that would have happened is there would have been a lot more uh, influence and territory permanently occupied by some of the European powers. The European powers wouldn't have given up, so to speak, on the United States uh, or on Central North America uh, if we hadn't uh, extended United States sovereignty all the way west to the, to the, uh, to the west coast. There would have been more, more land permanently belonging to the French, more belonging to the, the Spanish, uh, the English, who were still in Canada, might have come down. It would have been different. How many had their hand up here? Uh, I, I think it was inevitable. I, can, I think we can all agree it was inevitable expansion would have occurred, but it took some kind of impetus to really get it going. You know, even Texas, Expansion in Texas is kind of slow until they actually became a state because of problems like Indians that really deter a lot of people from coming here. And then the other big expansion, you know, after Lewis and Clark expedition, 1803, 1801, 1803, there was very little expansion in the United States for the next 50 years. I think the, one of the biggest impetus was what happened after the Civil War. Especially the, the, the great trail uh, cattle drive, you know, particularly the Chisholm Trail, the Great Western Trail, that went, you know, right in our neighborhood too. So it took impetus, and then followed by that, or almost in conjunction with that, was the railroad. And we didn't get the Trent Tunnel Railroad until like 1869. And then when we got that, we got the the, the need for uh, cattle up north. I think there's a lot of impetus that caused it. Then we were slowly, the Indians were slowly being, the Browns were taken from them, their, their, essentially their Walmart was, was taken from them when all the, the uh, Buffalo were killed off. Yeah. So I think if there was an impetus there and it would have occurred, it might have happened maybe, maybe a little quicker, but I think it happened all due time. This, you know, logical progression. I personally don't think the effect on the Civil War would have been different because if you look at the map, as Texas was part of it, but it didn't get expanded. But I do agree with the gentleman that without the access to the land, you have the Transcontinental Railroad, which actually gave movement of everything across the country uh, in the later years, 1870s, 1880s would have made a huge difference. That they would have had to negotiate each and every passway for a railroad say, at that point in time. Who would you negotiate with? Just like we pointed out earlier, there were so many different tribes or bands of Indians, and they weren't always there. So one month, you might be negotiating with somebody who has moved on to a different area from that standpoint. Uh, I thought what Lewis and Clark, when they came through, they even noted that the Indians were not the caretakers of Mother Earth, but we all think they are. They would drive herds of buffaloes off of cliffs. They didn't have any use for all of that community and everything. But they did as much damage, I think, as their technological ability was. I think when they gained more technology, they would have done probably more so even then. So I, sometimes I think we all think, oh, we were the ones that killed off all the buffalo and things like that, when in actuality, and the fact that they couldn't get along with each other, that they killed each other, that they enslaved each other, if they were together, if they would have ever been together, maybe the inevitable would have happened, but a lot of years too. Okay. Um, do you think Native Americans were justified in using raids, horrific torture, killing, gang rape, taking captives in their struggle against the advancing white settlements, against other tribes? It was just so horrific, but it, you know, I think we think in terms of more common warfare, this seems so much more barbaric. And I just, uh, I mean, 
I think what they went through uh, was awful. But I, you know, some of the, uh, I mean, what they did was just. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you look at what's going on in Ukraine yeah. right now. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, 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 you know, I mean, all these, all those items that I read off there, I mean, all of that stuff yeah. is going on in Ukraine right now. And there's no, there's very few Native Americans in Ukraine. Yeah, but the tortures, I think. Yeah, the scalping and the, 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 the slow deaths that they so enjoyed was, was shocking, I think, to her. Yeah. But I, I just disagree that it was just the Indians. Look at what happened during the Spanish Inquisition. Mm -hmm. Nothing worse except maybe the rape with the way they tortured people. Mm -hmm. Just like you said, what's going on in <coughs> Ukraine now. Things that took place during the Vietnam War, things that took place during the Second World War. It's it's the way people react, yes. and a lot a lot of it is I don't know if it's inbreeding or whatever, but it's it's not just the Native Americans. No, no. As a matter of fact, the Europeans did. It. The well, ones, now, I mean, I, did it. I'm going to I'm going to rephrase this question a different way. So, if we were the Native Americans. <laughs> and there were these other people who were coming and trying to take our land. Okay? Would we be justified in doing that? The book talks about the cavalry doing that. Yeah. And 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 using the other Indians to do it. Mm -hmm. It's just justification to do the exact same thing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're not holier than that. Nobody's justified in doing it, but everybody does it. Yeah. There was a hand up over here. Well, I think also we have to think that they didn't think like we did, obviously. They came from a different culture, different world, and to them, this was their way to survive. Exactly. And we may not like it. We were used to marching the British, you know, soldiers when they're all lined up walking towards their, you know, a very distinguished way of fighting and they just did not want to fight that way and I think that's just because of where they came from. They were in a, in a sense barbarians just like somebody mentioned and, and they just did with the, all, what they knew how they knew how to fight to survive. You look at Europeans 100 years before not all that much different. Yeah. <laughs> the, the Vikings. Okay. The Vikings. <laughs> Yeah, if you read the, the books about the Napoleonic Wars, mm -hmm. I mean, it's a lot of this stuff. French Revolution, they cut their heads off. Yeah. 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 Well, and they starved people to death in St. Petersburg. They starved a whole city in a matter of five months. Huh? Literally starved them to death. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a matter of degree in what you're looking at. And maybe the people who win the war gets to, do get to write the books. And so they put a perspective that we might see because, first of all, it's easier for us to feel better about ourselves than somebody else, but I don't think this notion of, of cruelty and barbarian is, is anything that has gone away. It's just yeah. differently done now. Well, you know, one thing I thought about this book, and I um, I thought that the author, S.C. Glenn, I thought he did, I thought he tried to give both sides of the story, but it's really difficult when one side keeps extensive records and the other side does not and you have to rely on oral histories in a shrinking population and all that and so what do you think this book would have looked like if the Comanche had had a written language I want to point out to you that their relatives the Aztec actually picked up a version of written language. Uh, it's a pictographic a written language on their way south that they probably picked up from the Maya and other tribes in Mexico. Um, and it's not uh, as definitive as having an alphabet-based language, but the Aztec and the Maya did read records that we're, despite the best efforts of the Spanish to destroy all of that, uh, that we are beginning to be able to read today. But how different would this book look like if um, the Comanche had kept written history? It'd be nice to have a letter to Iwo Jima, you know, like, we've got, we've got both sides of that battle 
be able to have both sides of it. Yeah. But well, what do you think their side of it would look like if they wrote this? If they wrote this book, defending their own land against the intruders, and yeah, and uh, yeah, mm -hmm. they were defending themselves. Yeah. Yeah. And defending their lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they were entitled to what they had. And, yeah. You know, you'd hear about the atrocities that we did, right. and yeah. all the awful things that we did. Changes. You know, if you read that question and you remove Native Americans and you put in Hitler's Germany, what's the difference? Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, does anybody else have their hand up? Okay, number four. Do you think the 150 year history of violence between Texans and Native Americans has had a long term impact of, on the culture of Texas? If so, how is that evident today? I think that uh, only um, men, settlers, who were prepared to um, have that level of combat and violence continue to um, populate the state of Texas, and to some extent, it is uh, an anchor to the uh, self-image and character that we associate with Texas. I mean, you know, I'm from Louisiana. There was not a whole lot of violence going on in the 1800s other than, uh, you know, being scarred out well, for a so battle or something like that, you know. But yeah, I mean, uh, that's, uh, that was two aspects of Western civilization fighting with one another, which is a whole other thing. But people coming to the state of Texas uh, notwithstanding that they knew this is what they would encounter, um, it takes a certain disposition to want to do that and to persist and to settle and to stay and to take that risk. You know, and I think that's true, but I think if you also look at today, Texas has 30 million people. So the white population prior to what, maybe 1840, something like that, was maybe, uh, maybe 50,000? It was about 35,000 is what, when Stephen Austin started his colonies down yeah. in Central Texas, it was about 35,000 yeah. by about, about 1832. About 1832. So, you know, somewhere it would have grown some in the next few years. So maybe by 1840 or 1850, it's maybe 40,000, 50,000. And now we have 30 million people. Hmm. And how many people, I mean, a huge percent of the people in the state of Texas today were not born in Texas, <laughs> you know? Um, but yet, I mean, from my perspective, I think you're right. I think this has a huge impact on uh, Texas. But that, you know, it was such a small number of people. And yet now, a hundred years later, do you think maybe that, of the, um, that uh, the characteristics that are, the physical characteristics of Texas that make it as densely populated in some parts as it is compared to the much more waterless plains, the, um, uh, the infill uh, took place much more slowly because there was an active combatant here fighting for to land. Oh, I think there's no, I think, to, uh, I think there's no doubt about that. that. But I'm talking about what's happened since you know. Oh yeah, I mean, the, this, it changes completely in 1880 yeah. on, and uh, um, but we also ended up the state itself had an existing population, and then began its own in migration straight out of Galveston from uh, the uh, immigrants that came here directly instead of coming through the rest of the United States on their way, and that. I mean, that shouldn't really be under, underestimated. Um, Europeans came straight into mm -hmm. that cultural mixing pot that we had going on that wasn't going on in the rest of the then United States. Um, anybody else? Yes. I, I think it clearly influenced the survival of the fittest. You know, where we fought against the Indians and they had to fight for everything. And you're correct, it was a much smaller population at that point in time. But it was a tough life also. Mm -hmm. 
it was a very tough one. But somehow or other, I think that ethos still has a huge impact on the 30 million of us who are here today. I just think that's it's amazing. Yeah. I think we glorify the Texas Rangers and the first settlers, and we have pride as Texans that they came in and were able to take over the property. Yeah. Oh, I think that's true. It's sort of the power of myth. I mean, there's some truth in there, but there's a lot of truth. Yeah. <clears throat> just an ad comment. You know, actually, there were people who settled into Texas. You mentioned the, the settlers coming from Germany that came up through Galveston. There were a lot of people that did that. Right. You know, but and they they came in, uh, and they came. A lot of them came to start plantations and raise cotton. But you know, in the 1830s and 1840s, and then what happened is when as the Civil War came into effect, those settlers backed away because the, all the cavalry, all their support from the U.S. government had disappeared. They were all fighting in the Civil War, and so there was a lot of pullback of settlements in Texas in the 1840s and 50s and 60s. And it wasn't until the Civil War was over with that they were able to come back in and just really finally finish off the, the Indian population. So, you know, there was a lot of stuff that had to do with, you know, the force that the United States could bring to, to suppress the Indian population. That happened after 1865. It, it happened in the war. Yeah, absolutely. The war. Absolutely. Because there were people who did come here and they came and they, couldn't take it, and they backed into into tighter tighter communities down in Central Texas. So he covered that in the book mm -hmm. when he talked about the Civil War mm -hmm. and how much more powerful the Comanches became during that temporarily during that time, yeah. that time frame. So, question five: You think Cynthia Ann's treatment at the hands of the Comanche was very different from that of her cousin Rachel Parker Palmer? Um, why do you think Cynthia Ann adapted so well to the Comanche way of life? And if you were in that party at the Pease River fight, would you have left her with the Comanche? By the way, this is a Cynthia Ann Parker shirt. <laughs> I came across a couple of years ago after I had read this book. I thought, oh, I gotta have it. So any thoughts about Cynthia, Anna, and Rachel? Well, they obviously were treated differently, at least after the first little while. The uh, Cynthia Ann was uh, was assimilated into the society, and they were nice to her, and they uh, they made her uh, feel good about her situation, and. Presumably, it was in her something in her genes uh, caused her to uh, be okay with that and to say, "This ain't so bad. I'm going to stay." And I like this Peter O'Connor guy uh, who is uh, <laughs> taking me in and feeds me good. And who knows? But uh, yeah, they definitely would treat you differently. Also, she had three kids. She, she was a little girl. Mm -hmm. yeah. I also always felt that she should have been allowed to go back. Yes. Her life was just miserable when she, they, they, they took her back and she was unhappy for the rest of her life. I thought that was awful. Yeah. She was basically a showpiece. Yeah. Something but there's, there's another book called Captured, and there they talk about uh, young boys that are captured and taken away. They said I've had to get up early in the morning doing chores, going to school, yep. coming back, doing more chores, getting to bed. They had the free reign to do what they wanted. Horses, and it was totally different culture, a lot easier, particularly for the men, but or for the boys, but yeah. the girls must have had the same freedom. Well, you know, one of the uh, points that uh, was made in the second book that I read, the Comanche Empire book, was about um, about slaves and about captives. Mm -hmm. And particularly starting in the 1700s, there was a real premium on female slaves. They wanted young female slaves, okay? As opposed to men. Now, boys were fine. Grown men they had very little use for them. But the, there was a big economic reason for wanting the female slaves. Does anybody have any idea? And the story of Rachel Plummer, tells you what that was. 
You remember what, what Rachel Plummer had to spend most of her time doing? Uh, working. Yeah, working. working on yeah, but what did she do? Working what was her work? Huh? Working on the buffalo. Yeah, buffalo hides. Yeah. Because that's that was women's work. And so once the Comanche had identified this demand for a commercial value for the buffalo hides, they had to meet that demand. And they needed workers, and they didn't have enough, and the men weren't going to do it. That was not a man's job. It was a woman's job, and they didn't have enough women. And so the women were at a premium, particularly younger women. Also, they said that for the reproduction. They said right. Yeah. Right. With the horses and things, they thought that's why they had so many miscarriages, etc. So the fact is that they needed women to reproduce. Yeah. Well, Cynthia ended up working with the, mm -hmm. when she was an adult woman, mm -hmm. uh, she was working with the buffalo hides and all, too. Mm -hmm. They say when they found her, she was covered with the grease and mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. all, all yeah. the, uh, Of course, I guess that keeps the bugs away. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, they might get stuck in it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, in Chapter 4, Gwen compares the Comanche warriors to the Celts, and later, in Chapter 5, to the Spartans. Both of these were war-driven cultures that prided themselves on being more fearless than their opponents. Can you think of any other historical cultures that remind you of the Comanche? I just don't know. So, who? Romans, Well, the Romans were a little different because many of them got territory, they claimed it. And then they established government and they controlled it by promoting people within that culture. Mm -hmm. So, but probably, if you talk about any, any nomadic group that would come in and take over territory, we would probably be more like Manches than, than the Celts and maybe the Romans or some other groups because they came in and they were nomadic. They came in, wiped people out, or took away their properties, whatever they needed, and moved on. And then came back from time to time to make sure they got more. But, it's that nomadic kind of group that's moving freely. Um, okay. So Gwen tries to be impartial throughout the book. Although it is difficult to sympathize with the Comanche in their ultimate fate, they were notorious for their extreme violence to all who stood in their way because they were notorious. How are you able to reconcile the savagery of the tribe with their nobility? Does this moral dichotomy even need to be reconciled, or is it wrong to apply modern standards of ethics to the Comanche? We've kind of touched on this before. Yeah. Does anybody else have anything they want to say? Well, except for the fact of calling them no, nobility. How, how are they noble? Other than they said he was a fine figure when, when he was fighting, but... Juana Park was really a good looking to call the Comanches as a whole noble, I don't, I don't see that. Well, I think yeah. you have to continually remind yourself when you're, when you're studying these things that I'm going to make a statement here that I believe anyway. And when our ancestors in the Stone Age or before that first picked up a club, they started beating the other guy to take his territory, to take his food, and to enslave people. Uh, this didn't just happen in, uh, in, in recent centuries. It's been going on for, for umpteen thousand years. Yeah, all over the world, not just in North America. Yeah, it's, 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 power. it's, it's power. part yeah. of our, our human, it's part of our animal mm -hmm. slash human nature. Well, you go back to that earlier question, though, even in the 1870s, Let's turn it around and say the Comanches were talking about killing, killing, raping, taking slaves. Guess what? We did it too. Yeah. So um, you know, that was normal. That's so how. Right, that's how. Normal. I mean, yeah. by and large, it wasn't Americans, but that's how all those black people got over here from Africa. Exactly. <laughs> you know, you stop to think about it. Um, okay. Question eight. Uh, Jack Coffee Hayes. Nicknamed Captain Yak, uh, was one of the first military officers to successfully adopt the Indian style of warfare and briefly managed to level the battlefield against the 
uh, along with the Texas Rangers of the 1830s and 1840s. Do you think if the Hayes style of fighting had been adopted immediately, the struggle would have lasted as long as it did? You don't think it would have made a difference? No, I think it would have. Oh, you think it would have? Okay. Any other opinions? If they had uh, if they brought it back east, uh, the Civil War would have been different, too. If, uh, if uh, whoever side Hayes would have ended up on uh, would have decided to uh, change the, the mode of battle and, and use, uh, use the same tactics against the North or the South, whichever. It would have been a different kind of a war. Well, a few people did. Who was it? Was it Mosby? Was it somebody named Mosby who was a um, hit and runner? Hidden, hidden, uh, Nathan Bedford Forrest was kind of that school. Yeah. We were a lot more successful in, in the revolution using guerrilla warfare than, than the North and South were successful 100 years later by using European warfare. But it all studied at West Point. All the, all the officers that studied at West Point, what the, whichever side of the war they were on, they were still up. Okay, so this is talking about the scene at the end of the book where Quana and his fellow Comanche are allowed off the reservation for a buffalo hunt. And there are no buffalo to be found, and they are reduced instead to hunting cattle. Um, so this uh, leads to a few questions. Would the Comanche have been forced to give up their way of life even if they had not engaged in war? Would they eventually have been rendered obsolete or extinct because of their inability and unwillingness to adapt to the ever-modernizing world around them? Quana did pretty well. He did. He did. Yeah, he he did. Yeah. Well, I went to a uh, presentation a few months ago that was given by one of Quana's many, many, many um, I don't know if he's a great, 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 or a great, 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 great <laughs> grand. Well, you were there. Yeah. You heard him. And he seems to have had a very nice career running the... Uh, he's a medical tech. He's a... Presbyterian. Yeah, I think he's I think he's like the head of the department, you know, and he grew up in... Where did he grow up? North Richland Hills? Yeah, yeah. And I don't know, what did he say his dad did? I don't remember. His dad had his dad was I think a professional man, but he also had a bit part in uh, Walker Texas Ranger as a medicine man. <laughs> you know, where it's just to make a few bucks on the side. And he had some pictures of his dad in, in his uh, in his TV costume. But he was I don't know he was a dentist or something like that in real life. But he played a medicine man. So. Not much call for medicine men anymore. No, no, no. <laughs> if you look at all the Indian nations that the United States tried to force and change, none of them adapted well. So I don't believe the Comanches would have been any different than any of the other ones. I mean, we put them on reservations and tried to kill them off. We didn't allow them to have their own culture, if you will. Even today, the only culture they have is the casinos, right. and I hate to say that, but you know, without that, they'd almost be non-existent at this point in, time. in our society. You know, when you think about how how many different tribes there were and what we've done for them. How is this different or the same as what the U.S. tried to do in Afghanistan? No different, and look at how successful that was. <laughs> A lot of similarity. Multiple different tribes separated and no central leadership. So yeah. the biggest difference is we killed most of them off in Afghanistan. So is as as that the lesson? No. No. Kill no, you hope not. Don't let him survive. <laughs> that get out. Okay. Anybody else? Any other thoughts? Manifest destiny just would have eventually pushed them out of the way. They wanted the land. Yeah. They wanted to expand. They the and uh, no matter how the Comanche might have tried to meet them in the middle, it, it wouldn't have happened. But the same thing happened with the Eastern Indians. They, a lot of them were uh, 
uh, try to reconcile the differences and, mm -hmm. and peacefully coexist. And as the, uh, the uh, European-based population wanted to go west of the coastal area, they just kept pushing them out of the way, mm -hmm. pushing them further to the frontier. Yeah. Would it just continue to happen? Elaine? I don't, I don't know that there's an answer to the question I'm going to ask, but um, I wonder why it was so different here than in Africa, where the European countries went in and kind of chopped up Africa, um, Belgium and England and, you know. And yet today, most of those countries are still... A, you know, run by Africans and all. I mean, you know, have gotten their independence and and all. So I, I just, it's curious to me what the. What I the have a suggested answer. I do not know if this is the answer, but I'll throw this out as an idea. Okay, in North America, the white Europeans had disease. We had disease on our side. Yeah. In Africa, we did not. Right. Didn't. No. no, it was the other way around. It was the other way around. The Africans had it on their side. Yeah. Yeah. They were these all those bugs. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, I think that had a huge amount to do with it. Yeah. I mean, maybe part of it was the, the fact that we came here and settled more so than it happened in Africa. But there's, but you have to ask why. But, you know. Yeah. And I think the answer is, although a lot of white people died of disease in, uh, in North America, too, but... But once we, but what, the stuff we brought with us, the smallpox, the measles, the mumps, all that, that stuff, you know, was just dead to, to, these, to the Native Americans because they had no resistance. And that's why Native Americans like Juana Parker, who had white blood, right. who had inherited some resistance from their uh, white ancestor, um, fared far better than people who did not have any white ancestry. Now that, I don't know if that's the answer. That's just my thought. It's just curious. Uh, Juana also gained height, apparently, yes. from his um, European ancestry. Yeah. yeah, and she was not tall, but they describe her as being huge compared to the Comanche women, so this Comanche women must have been like this. I didn't look short. like that. Because yeah. I think she went, I think Cynthia Ann Parker was 5'4 five, or 5'5. Five, five. Wow. Oh and she was, I mean, at least by my standards, she was for her culture. Small, but uh, she must have been a giant among them. But, but you said the Comanche women from the Aztecs, and if you been down to Mexico, they're short people. They're short people. Right. Yeah, well, I mean, that's just, uh, just the way it's true. Okay, any other thoughts on that one? Okay, and I think this, yes, this is it. This is the end. So I want somebody to give a really great piece of insight. So we can end on a high note. In the final chapter, Gwen writes about Kwame's legacy. The contrast could not be greater with his more famous neighbor, Geronimo goes on to explain that while Geronimo was not well liked by Indians on the reservation and died a drunk and a gambler, uh, Kwana is remembered as one of the last great Indian chiefs. Uh, so, do you think we will still remember Kwana 100 years from now, and what do you think his lasting legacy will be, if he has one? Yeah. And I think, you know, I mean, I think he would be a great subject for a movie. Yeah. He was really a good-looking man. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you see pictures of him, and he's pretty old. He's still pretty impressive, you know? I mean, I would look twice. Um, I think most of the ladies in this room would, too. Anyway. Well, this is a comparison between two uh, Native, Americans, Native Americans, but you also had that uh, comparison you made earlier between Custer and whatever. Sitting Bull. Sitting Bull. No, 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 no. no. Oh, the two white guys. Oh, oh, oh. oh yeah. Custer, Custer, Custer and McKenzie. McKenzie, yeah. McKenzie. Yeah. And, and the one that didn't win was the one we remember, just like Geronimo had this 
aura about him, and he's the one we know more about instead of um, Juana. We like, the bad, boy, we like yeah. the bad boys? I just like we remember, remember the Alamo, too. Mm -hmm. Well, Absolutely. yeah. Absolutely. Have you read that book yet? Forget the Alamo? Uh, yeah. It's oh. pretty good. Yeah, <laughs> the answer to his legacy will live on. Uh, I think it's going to fade. Uh, he's a relatively small player in, in the Indian battles from the U.S. Uh, and the only reason I think his legacy lives on as much as it has because his mother was a, a white lady. She was in a great many tried to repatriate her and such. How many people in here really knew who Kwana was before you read this book? Well, like I said, he's not, I mean, I knew the name, but I did not know the story until I read this book. And he wound up in Oklahoma. Right. And, I mean, you know, Oklahoma does not have a lot of history, but most of it has to do with Indians, and they didn't even teach us about one. I mean, we have a we have a city in Texas that's called a very small city. Yeah. We have another city. 60 miles from here is called Nakona, Texas. Does anybody know before reading this who Nakona really was? I think he's okay. I think within his own small culture gets smaller and smaller and diluted more all the time. I think his notoriety is largely a Texas thing. When I arrived here 20 some years ago, I, I, I don't think I'd ever heard of Otto Parker. I didn't know who he was until um, we moved to Fort Worth. And of course, that's the, the center of, or part of the center of where all this action took place that's covered in the book. And we learned who Juana Parker was, and Cynthia Ann Parker, just from Scuttlebutt and interacting with other Texans. I, I don't. I, I think that explains why the rest of the country doesn't know too much about Juan Parker, nor I don't, cares. I did. And 100 years from now, it's going to be even more archaic. Well, don't you think that Geronimo's resistance to the military was it was one of the reasons why he's remembered? He had a very fierce resistance to the military, and it was documented more so maybe than what happened with Juan Parker. I think that, you know, part of that is, you know, that whoever tells the story, whoever has the opportunity to tell the story. And I, and I think that maybe why we think of Geronimo more. And the fact that you end up a drunk and a gambler, and that happens, you know, people as they, as they lose their glory, oftentimes they fall into despair and all kinds of things, bad things happen to them. But Madonna, you, did, you said one of the key things that was documented, you know. Yes, you don't realize how much yeah. the documentation. Oh, it makes a difference. Yeah, it does make a difference, yes. And then when we went to that thing with uh, his great great grandson, mm -hmm. uh, he said the Comanche language was not the written language exactly. until 1995. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. That's huge. Yeah. So they didn't document it. So now that we've got the language, we start talking about it, you'll remember mm -hmm. more so than he was before. Well, and uh, you know, I do not know the answer about Quanta Parker, but I will say I have never read anything about reporters from Eastern newspapers coming to Texas to cover that story. The end of the end of the Comanche um, in the wild. Um, but there were quite a few who First went to time. Arizona oh, yeah. to yeah. cover what happened with Geronimo, and uh, one of them. Well, he wasn't a, not exactly a reporter, but uh, Frederick Remington was out there oh, and did a lot of what became eventually very famous famous paintings and sculpture sculptures, which were based on those Indian Wars and sort of gave a exactly. to the white population there was an image of what that was like. And if you look at if you go to the Amon Carter Museum and you go into the Frederick Remington room, there's a big painting of all these uh, people that look like cowboys on horses and they're riding towards you. It's a very dynamic painting. And back in the corner, are they're being chased by Indians, okay? And back in the far right corner, there's a bunch of Indians and they're Geronimo type Indians. You can tell by the way they're dressed. Uh, and they're, they're way back there. So that's part of the lore of 
Right, and, and again, it was, it was a story that was told, as you said, that story about Toronto has been told many times in different, many different fashions, so it's going to survive. Where Quantum Park story is not that well, well, well told, or commonly yeah. yeah. told. Well, so. the, the history of uh, movies and TV programs that we right. all grew up yes. with. Absolutely. Uh, did you cover the Comanches for the most part? Did you usually were dealing with the Apaches? Yeah. And people right, further right. west. Mm -hmm. yeah. How come? How That's come when I was, was I'm sorry, when I was growing up, if you were doing something that was dangerous, like jumping off a, a high thing, a cliff, or if you had a cliff, or roof, <laughs> roof, <laughs> yeah, there you go, the second story, you know, things like that, you would never yell out, "Wana!" <laughs> Okay, well that's it folks. Thank you everybody for coming. Once again,